It is only a very few individuals who stand out in a historical perspective as those who have changed the course of that subject in a profound and fundamental way. In astronomy, Sir Fred Hoyle is undoubtedly such a figure. His work over the post four years in which he applied nuclear physics to astronomy led to a major revolution in astronomical thought. Thanks to Sir Fred's pioneering work, we now have a great deal of knowledge about nuclear processes that go on in the deep interiors of stars, stars like the sun, and also how these processes produce the whole range of chemical elements such as carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, and so on that we see everywhere around us. Sir Fred is, of course, better known, at any rate in the popular view, as the man who invented the steady-state theory of the universe. It is also fair to say that hardly any area in astronomy has at some time not been benefited by a contribution from Sir Fred, some of these contributions being, of course, more controversial than others. Sir Fred has held many positions of great distinction including the Plumian Chair of Astronomy at the University of Cambridge, which he held for many years. He is now an honorary fellow of St. John's College, Cambridge, as well as, incidentally, an honorary professor at my own university at Cardiff. He is a fellow of the Royal Society and one of its former vice presidents, a foreign associate of the United States National Academy of Sciences, an honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, to name but a few of his more ephemeral distinctions. He is also a gold medalist of the Royal Astronomical Society, a royal medalist of the Royal Society, and a United Nations Kalinga Prize winner. My own association with Sir Fred extends over a long period of 22 years. First, as his research student, later as a colleague and collaborator, an association that has, of course, continued to the present day. On behalf of the Institute of Fundamental Studies and the President of Sri Lanka, His Excellency President Jayar Jawadana, it is my very pleasant duty to call on Sir Fred Hoyle to deliver his lecture on the subject from virus to cosmology. Sir Fred. Thank you, Shandra, for your kind opening remarks. I'm going to tell you today a story which, if you hear it in the course of a single hour, may seem very strange to you. And certainly, it would have seemed strange to me some 20 years ago when uh, the path which led to this work um, began to be followed. It, it is the outcome of some 20 years uh, study of various questions with many of the links along the road being taken um, reluctantly. So let me begin then without more ado. On a clear night far away from the artificial light of towns, cities and even villages you can see the bright band of the Milky Way overhead. Inspection by naked eye shows a large dark cleft in the constellation of Sagittarius. This cleft isn't due to an absence of stars. Could you have the lights down, please? The lights down. 
isn't due to an absence of stars, but to a comparatively nearby cloud of tiny dust particles, which cuts out the light of stars on the far side of the cloud. Inspection of the Milky Way by telescopes shows many cases on a smaller scale of this blocking of starlight by clouds of dust particles. And indeed, the particles exist in some degree everywhere throughout the Milky Way, throughout our galaxy, that is to say, and in other galaxies too. Could I have the first slide, please? Well, this is a, a region of the Milky Way uh, directed almost towards the center of our galaxy, and you can see plenty of places in here where there is evidence of dark material. This is the kind of cloud material that I've been speaking about. Could I have the next slide, please? Here you can see evidence here in such places quite clearly. Um, next slide, please. Well, this, this is the famous horse's head, uh, and a case where you see very obviously the presence of a dark cloud, which by chance just happens to imitate a horse's head, blocking out the light of, uh, that, come, that is behind it, which you can see, see just all around the head. The next slide, please. Well, here you're looking not uh, at a little system within our own Milky Way, within our own galaxy, but you're looking at the, the galaxy NGC 5128, and here there is a great band of dark material across the whole of the galaxy. So you can see that the, the dust particles producing the fogging of starlight exist on, a, on an enormous scale there. The next slide, please. This is the so-called Sombrero Hat galaxy in the constellation of Virgo. And once again, you can see the dark band of the dust extending across the whole of this galaxy. By the 1930s, astronomers had begun to measure this extinction of starlight in a quantitative way. Not just for starlight generally, as one sees it by eye, but for light confined to particular wave bands, particular colors. Such measurements, when taken with the electromagnetic theory of James Clark Maxwell, as it was developed in the year 1908 by the German scientist Gustav Mee, permits one to infer the size distribution of the dust particles rather precisely. If one looks back now to the 1950s, it was commonly stated in the astronomical literature that the particles had to possess diameters mostly in the range from a half to one micrometer. It was also found that a fair fraction of the particles had to be rod-shaped. The mystery in astronomical circles was that the particles possessed much the same properties everywhere. The particles in one part of interstellar space were apparently of the same nature as in another part of space. Nobody could think of any natural physical process of origin for inorganic particles, particles like crystals of ordinary ice, that would produce such remarkable uniformity. Nobody, certainly including myself, thought in the 1950s or the 1960s to consult a textbook on bacteriology. Otherwise, we would have found the information to be seen in the next slide. This is a slide in which the ordinate is, represents the number of bacteria of a spore-forming kind for each of the intervals shown in the histogram. And whereas nobody over all the years was ever to, able to match the observations closely, making calculations uh, for, uh, oh, I should perhaps explain that the di this, this is diameter along here, diameter of the, of the organisms in microns. And you can see just this feature that uh, that you have the uh, uh, the peak 
uh, in precisely the position indicated by the astronomical observations. I should explain that before I go on. Uh, nobody over all the years was ever to, able to match the observations closely, making calculations for the most favorable assumption concerning inorganic grains, a calculation made in less than a week for particles with this size range and possessing a refractive index appropriate for bacteria which had been dried out, where all the internal water was evaporated out as it would be at the very low pressure of interstellar space, gave the excellent result that you can see in the next slide, please. Well, the points on here are the observational points and the curve is the curve calculated uh, without any uh, assumption at all except that the particles are bacteria. Then we simply use all the laboratory properties of bacteria. That, uh, and then one can calculate this and one uh, obtained uh, an excellent um, agreement uh, we, almost immediately. So that after some 20 years of struggling to understand this data, here with an apparently wild hypothesis was a, an almost perfect fit. One could also go on to say that the effect of heating biomaterial moderately in vacuo, in space, is to drive off water which tends to leave a coalified kind of residue. This is, of course, what happens when material is buried inside the earth. It coalifies, um, essentially due to the uh, removal of water molecules. Such a residue has enormous absorptivity in the ultraviolet, particularly for biologically damaging radiations around 2,500 angstroms. Measurements made in the ultraviolet using rocket-borne equipment to get above the Earth's atmosphere shows that a fraction of the interstellar dust has exactly this property. So one could say that although the hypothesis that dust particles are bacteria together with degeneration products from bacteria may seem preposterous, the plain fact is that the hypothesis works. As you can see from the more extended comparison with the observational data shown in the next slide where we go into the ultraviolet. Go to the next slide, please. So this is what happens, and I should explain here, this is a measure of the fogging effect of the particles plotted on a logarithmic scale. The details of the logarithmic scale needn't trouble us. And along the bottom here, there is the, uh, uh, the inverse of the wavelength that one is using uh, measure with the wavelength measured in micrometers. So on the right, you have the ultraviolet, and on the left, you have the red. The points on here are the observations, and the, 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 the curve is the effect of calculation. So as I say, although the hypothesis is preposterous, it works. Turning now to the infrared, to much longer wavelengths, siliceous materials, material containing silicon atoms linked to oxygen, have much stronger absorption near 10 micrometers, way out in the infrared on this slide, way out in here, sort of getting down, down in this region, in the infrared. 10 micrometers, they have much stronger absorption siliceous materials than carbonaceous materials. And some astronomers have argued that evidence of both absorption and emission of radiation in this long wave region around 10 microns implies the existence in considerable abundance of inorganic silicate minerals among the interstellar particles. Yet 15 years of searching in the laboratory has failed with inorganic mineral silicates to match closely the astronomical observations for even the simplest case, that of infrared emitting particles in the so-called trapezium region of the well-known Orion Nebula. Could I have the next slide, please? You see the Orion Nebula here. Well, the trapezium region is, is around here in the nebula there. 
uh, this. And it happens that the particles there are heated to a temperature of approaching 200 degrees Kelvin and the radiation which they emit can be detected. And it is found that whereas the observations vary smoothly with respect to wavelength, with a maximum emission at around 10 micrometers, individual inorganic minerals have sharply varying bands that are not in agreement with the data. The best that can be done is to mix various minerals in an attempt to smooth the sharply varying features. But this raises the difficulty that mixtures will be expected to vary from one place to another, unlike the interstellar particles, which seem to be more or less the same everywhere. As well, now, as well as inorganic minerals, there are microorganisms which contain silicious materials. Recently, a sample of such microorganisms was examined in the laboratory by Mr. S. Almofti. Not a sample carefully adjusted to suit the astronomical facts, but a sample taken simply from local river water, something you could do anyway. You can do it here in Colombo from your local river. The experimental results led immediately to the curve shown in the next slide, please. The points are for this trapezium region, these are the observations, and this is what you calculate from the properties of the stuff that you get out of your local river. And this agrees far better with the data points than the most careful fiddling with inorganic minerals had achieved in 15 years. Because I don't believe that wrong theories give such good results, such a good correspondence with observation immediately without any trouble as we have here, I felt obliged to take seriously the proposition that life is a cosmic phenomenon. The question then was what does one do about it? Correct theories in the past always seem to have repercussions in all manner of directions. So the concept of life as a cosmic phenomenon, if it's correct, should have many consequences, some quite likely unexpected at first. And so it's natural to ask what could these consequences be? If one approached the usual notion that life originated here on the earth in a so-called organic soup from definite knowledge that life really did originate here, then I suppose the theory might seem plausible. But we don't have any such definite knowledge. And if one has an initially serious doubt that life had a terrestrial origin, then quite frankly, the organic soup theory doesn't look very good. One notices, for instance, that its advocates have addressed themselves to the problem of the origin of amino acids and to the polymerization of amino acids into polypeptides, but that the problem of the precise ordering of the amino acids, which is of course the essence of the situation where life is concerned, has scarcely been addressed at all. And I, I tend to feel that when um, workers tend to concentrate on what are on the part of the problem that isn't the main part at the expense of what is really relevant, uh, in my case at any rate, my suspicions are aroused. But the need to argue this point at length, whether life is of terrestrial origin or not, has in my view been to a large extent removed by Professor Hans Flug uh, from West Germany, who's followed early work by Klaus and Nagy um, of about 20 years ago, and both Professor Flug uh, and Professor Nagy will, are here at the conference and will be speaking about these matters, I hope, themselves. But Professor Flug has, has permitted me to show a couple of slides, which in my view uh, sort of takes the heat out of this problem. It shows, uh, I believe, fairly clearly that, uh, that life does exist outside the Earth. Uh, what Flug has done is to examine meteorites, which is just the same thing that Nagy did 20 years ago. And meteorites are thought 
to be debris from collisions of comets with asteroids, perhaps, uh, and sometimes they're bits of asteroids and sometimes bits of comets. The Murchison meteorite, which is the meteorite in question in, in the slides I'm going to show you, uh, fell on the 28th of September 1969 near the town of Murchison in Australia, and it had made hundreds of millions, well, million or, or so, of revolutions around the sun, coming in each revolution closer to the sun than the earth, when it became heated sufficiently to partially coalify uh, any uh, living cells it may once have had. Uh, measurements in the ultraviolet show that the carbonaceous material of this Murchison meteorite is somewhat more qualified than a lignite, but not so much qualified uh, as a, a moderately high rank coal. So if I can have the next slide, please. Well, what you have in here, this is just uh, a selection of objects and uh, of, of, an, of a particular object. Professor Flug will be showing many more tomorrow. What you have is the terrestrial specimen on the left and the meteoritic specimen on the right. And although one is joined, I believe, not to believe in morphological comparisons, to me there is no question about the morphological comparison there. The, the head where the main biochemistry takes place in this organism, a bacterium, uh, although it's a little hard to believe, it is a bacterium which has the effect of swapping oxygen atoms around so as to oxidize magnesium and iron, ferrous iron to ferric iron, for example. And what you can see on the right is, uh, is a very similar uh, organism in the meteorite. There are many arguments to, I think, I believe, to, um, to make it doubtful that this is uh, an example of contamination. For one, one thing, you can see that perhaps owing to the extremely dry conditions in the meteorite, the specimen on the right is stunted. Um, and uh, compared to, to the specimen on the left, it's, it's, the scale is smaller. If one looks at the, the heads of these, this is two to three times smaller, actually, than the, the, the terrestrial specimen, which is larger. But there are many, uh, many other arguments. For instance, uh, the, the, the specimen is coalified, it's, it's carbonized, charred, and that would mean that if it were a... It would seem to me to mean that if it were a... Um, quite terrestrially, the meteorite would have had to suck it in whilst it was coming through the air and whilst it was hot. And meteorites don't suck things in, they're, they're blowing gases off, they're not sucking it in. And after, after sucking it in, it, the, the meteorite would have to arrange that it was a stunted specimen that it, stuck to, uh, that it sucked in, and that looks very improbable. Besides which, uh, there are plenty of other cases in the meteorite, and, and this is not unique. The next slide, please. So again, you have Flug's picture, which I showed you a moment ago there. Well, this is another thing in the meteorite that you can see here, and then if you go up to the top there, you can see now on a somewhat different scale, a uh, smaller scale, you can see there's a whole great cluster of the, of the things. And uh, I make so bold as to assert that is not contamination. It doesn't seem to me to be so. So here, I think, in, in almost in one move, uh, one deals with the, the, the problem of uh, whether life is terrestrial or not. But besides that, there are very many, uh, many other arguments of which I've given you one astronomical argument before, before coming to these slides. So far, then, I've been concerned with what one might describe as past history, things that have happened in the past. It's again a matter of experience that successful theories never relate entirely to what is dead and done with. They always seem to turn out to have relevant connections to present day situations. And so it's natural to say, could it be so in this case? Microorganisms inside whole comets, which are of course very much bigger bodies than meteorites, remain in a deeply frozen condition in the outer regions of the solar system, except for the small fraction of comets which experience unusual gravitational perturbations due to close approaches to one or more of the outer planets. 
Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, or Neptune. Such perturbations can, in exceptional cases, bring a comet to the inner regions of the solar system, to the vicinity of the Earth. There's then an evaporation of material from comets due to the increased heat of the sun. Could you have the next slide, please? Well, the, the, this, this is a comet which has already experienced the orbit of a comet, Halley's Comet, which has already experienced the perturbations that bring it to the center of the, the, uh, of the solar system, as you can see here. And there are quite a number of other similar cases. Could you have a next slide, please? When the uh, particles, uh, when the comet um, becomes, comes close to the sun, uh, there, there's an evaporation of, of material from it, and it is known from spectroscopy that that material has ratios of the four main life-forming elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen, that is essentially identical to their ratios inside living materials. That can be determined spectroscopically when this process happens. So there's really no uh, question about the main composition of the, of the volatile material of comets. That is lifelike. And the striking thing is I know of no other body uh, where compositions have been measured where this is true. It's not even true for the Earth's biosphere. There's a great shortage of nitrogen in the Earth's biosphere, as every farmer knows. Uh, the, but in the comets, everything is just right. So um, here we, uh, we have an, an indication, again, of, of the right kind of chemistry. Particles uh, are also a particulate matter, again with sizes of the order of a micron, are also evaporated out of comets so that the Earth finds itself perpetually in a halo of evaporated cometary material. Could I have the lights up now, please, for a while? So we can ask the question, could I have the lights up, please? Uh, do we have proof that microorganisms are, in fact, being added to the Earth from outside? Because now, you see, we've taken the ideas from the past, uh, from a remote past, and, and sort of put them into the present moment of time, which, as I said before, is something that one has to do uh, with, with the theory if it is to work. I don't believe any successful theories uh, relate to, entirely to what is dead and done with. So the question is, do we have proof of this? The problem in seeking an answer to this question is to distinguish new microorganisms coming from outside from the large populations of microorganisms that are in residence here already. It seemed to Chandra Wickramasinghe and myself that the best chance of coping with this difficulty would be if some among the new microorganisms that might be entering the Earth's atmosphere were able to cause diseases in terrestrial plants and animals. This is because a pathogenic microorganism multiplies itself enormously in the body of its victim, in some cases by thousands of billions. Terrestrial plants and animals could therefore be regarded as highly sensitive detectors for pathogens from space, although of course there's still the problem of distinguishing attacking microorganisms of external origin from attacks due to pathogens in residence here already. This, in my own case, was a crisis point. The medieval notion of diseases coming from comets has in modern times been a matter for great amusement in astronomical and medical circles. And so no sensible person would, for preference, want to get involved in that kind of thing. It is just simply asking for trouble to get involved in it. Yet, as I've said, the arguments lead this way. The material evaporated from comets is remarkably lifelike, as I've just said. And so uh, one really had to force oneself, whatever the consequences, to at least give some consideration to the matter. 
I was myself hesitating to take this step, still fearing ridicule, still hearing in my imagination the laughter in university common rooms, when at last I was swayed by a curious and seemingly inconsequential detail. I was sitting one night in front of a blazing log fire, reading the little potted histories of infectious diseases given in an old edition of the, uh, we've known as the principles and practice of medicine, the sort of thing that student, medical students read from cover to cover. Well, I use an old edition because I wanted it before the use of modern antibiotics. Uh, I was reading this when I noticed the word variola to be of medieval origin. Why was the ancient Latin word not used, I wondered. A quick dash to a comprehensive Latin dictionary, which had belonged 40 years ago to my wife, soon showed that there'd been, that there'd been no ancient Latin word for pockmark. Not having a dictionary of ancient Greek in the house, it took a couple of days to confirm that the Greeks also had no word for pockmark. Then a friend who's the professor of classical history at Cambridge University told me that he knew of no ancient writer who had described a person with a pockmark countenance. Nor could Chandra Wickrama Singer and I find a description of smallpox in the Hippocratic writings. All this was inexplicable except on the basis that smallpox did not exist in ancient Greece and Rome, at any rate up to the second century AD. It seemed then as if diseases, even very infectious diseases, have been historically variable, as will be conceivable if diseases are incident from space. Let me interrupt my argument for a moment by considering the following scenario. Suppose pathogenic viruses are indeed incident from space. Suppose a new viral disease with a high death rate were to arrive from some comet, a disease against which no effective vaccine could be found. To add to the horrors, Suppose the disease highly infectious like smallpox, but unlike smallpox, suppose the virus to be shed before clinical symptoms could be recognized, so that the spread of the disease couldn't be prevented by isolating its victims. Suppose, too, that the virus were to maintain its incidence without remission decade after decade. What would happen? Well, densely populated cities will become uh, become impossible to live in and would soon decay into tiny collections of houses. Survivors will become spread over the land as thinly as possible. Even so, epidemics might still run. And if they did, the total world population would continue to decline until the surface density of people on the earth fell to the point where the transmission of the disease was held to a smoldering condition. In other words, human society would be un obliged to uncivilize itself and would be prevented from re-aggregating into substantial towns for as long as the incidence of the virus continued. This scenario, which is quite imaginary in our own day, fortunately, corresponds closely to what actually happened 1,500 years ago when Roman civilization collapsed into the Dark Ages. This scenario mayn't have been the cause of that collapse, but I now rather suspect that it was. I also suspect that much of what we call history was medically rather than politically determined. These ideas raise the question of where vital diseases come from in the first place. Stone Age populations of 10,000 years ago and earlier were too sparse to maintain diseases, the diseases that are confined to man, measles for example. So where had the measles virus come from? One naturally, one again asks. A question that leads naturally to a consideration 
of extremely remote, isolated populations in modern times. As, for instance, the Trio. The Trio are a small tribe of about 500 persons formerly living in dense forests near the equator in northern Brazil and southern Suriname. Tribes in this area had a reputation among explorers as ferocious bow hunters, given to wiping out any strangers who managed to penetrate the dense forests which existed before the present clearance schemes came into operation. By the early 1960s, however, the clearance scheme started by the Suriname government brought the group of Trio Indians out into the light of day. Exposed to the scrutiny of the world, as it were, survivors were found from attacks of poliomyelitis, which must have occurred decades before the clearance scheme came into operation. Evidently, then, the virus in question had existed in a group of only a few hundred persons that, were out, that was out of contact with the rest of the world, completely out of contact. It seems then that viral diseases have probably always been present, irrespective of the density of susceptible persons, irrespective of the diffuseness of the human population. And this is a hard nut for conventional theories. Hard nut for them to crack but not, of course, a hard nut if one supposes things are coming in from outside. Here next is a quotation from the book by Sir Christopher Andrews entitled The Common Cold. It concerns a Dutch physician of the name Van Logan. Van Logan, in 1925-26, carried out a postal canvas of about 7,000 persons in different parts of the Netherlands over a period from September to June. He was concerned to find out about the occurrence of colds in relation to time and space. He analyzed the results of his canvas and plotted them as curves. The curves showing the incidence of colds week by week were quite complicated ones. An astonishing thing was that the complicated curves from one part of Holland could be fitted over those from another part of the country and the fit was remarkably close. This showed two things. First, the time of rise and fall of the colds was almost exactly the same in different places. And second, the extent of the rise was also similar. He argued, not unreasonably, that all this would not fit in with a stepwise person-to-person -person spread of the cold. Such findings are not isolated, very similar things have been reported by workers in the United States. Well, that's Sir Christopher Andrews. So as long as 1926, there was clear evidence of a common cold virus falling from the atmosphere over a fairly wide geographic area. Next, just a word about influenza. It's usually supposed that we contract this disease through a person-to-person -person transmission of the causative virus. Epidemiological proof of this opinion is said to be given by high attack rates on people living together institutionally, as in schools, hospitals, or barracks, military barracks. The logic of this supposed proof is as obscure to me as it would be to say that when, it, when many spectators at a football match are wetted in a sudden rainstorm, the explanation isn't the rainstorm at all, but that the spectators took it into their heads to throw water over each other. Airborne pathogens would be expected to swirl about hither and thither, hitting particular areas with the same capriciousness as spring showers. The logically correct way to prove that a disease is really transmitted by person-to-person -person contact would be to show that nobody out of contact with others ever becomes a victim to the disease. And conversely, the person-to-person -person transmission idea is negatived if we can show that people out of contact with others do indeed catch the disease. So it was 
in Sardinia. Could have the lights down now again, please. So it was in Sardinia in 1948. The detailed subtype of the influenza virus that was dominant in 1948 first showed itself in Sardinia, in the Mediterranean, an island where at that time communications were virtually non-existent. Reporting on his findings, could I have the lights down please, uh, concerning the outbreak, uh, this particular outbreak, uh, Professor F. Magrassi wrote in volume 40 of the Minerva Med Torino the following, which I would hope to see on the next slide, if we can get the next slide, please. Well, I'll read that. We were, this is what Magrassi wrote. We were able to verify the appearance of influenza in shepherds who were living for a long time alone in solitary open country far from any inhabited center. This occurred almost contemporaneously with the appearance of influenza in the nearest inhabited centers. General practitioners are accustomed uh, to their surgeries being filled, at least they're accustomed in northern latitudes, in England, Germany, United States, are accustomed to their surgeries being filled to overflowing during the weeks of late winter by patients suffering from respiratory ailments and from those mysterious stomach uh, troubles which go, seem to go around, as people say. It makes no difference whether the general practitioners are in the northern or southern geographic hemisphere. The relevant period is always middle to late winter, six months apart in the two hemispheres. And these epidemic diseases that I'm speaking about are mostly of vital origin. The thing goes on year after year without explanation in conventional terms. If the cause were simply physical, as for instance, cold, te low temperature, or getting wet due to, due to rain, proof would be almost trivially demonstrable in the laboratory. And, uh, and many, many people have tried this and, and it doesn't work. It, it isn't the simple physical things. The annual effect experienced in a particular hemisphere points to a major atmospheric effect with the six months apart alternating in the two geographic hemispheres being pointing to a relation of the Earth's axis of rotation to the direction of the sun. Could I have the next slide, please? Oh, th this, uh, this shows you now the things that I said. Uh, the, the, this is data from England, and it shows this particular vital complaint, how it peaks uh, at the beginning here of 1980, at the beginning of 1981. It's the same thing. Yeah, that, that's, that's the effect, the winter effect. Could I have the next slide, please? Here you see two quite different diseases. Uh, the, the 52 is the 52nd week in the year, and, and you start again the new year. Just as the new year starts, off she goes. That's influenza. And here you've got a quite different virus, the respiratory syncytial virus. And off she goes just again at the same time. So uh, this, this is the effect. Could I have the next slide, please? Well, this is a somewhat complicated slide. And, uh, I'm sorry for the complexities, but the, the thing to look at is, is the modern slide here. This is an earlier, uh, earlier one up here, but the one down here is modern in which uh, atmospheric physicists have tried to, uh, um, to, to put all the things that, uh, about atmospheric motions into their calculations and uh, swirls, planet waves, and uh, turbulence, and so forth. But the net effect is of a circulation which, uh, which goes sort of uh, through the high air, follow, follow the big arrows. I can't quite show you with this light, but follow the big arrows. It sort of rises over the equator and falls uh, in latitude about 50 to 60. And this, I think, is, uh, uh, it's easy to understand that this is a winter effect because the, when in winter gets the maximum temperature difference between pole and equator in the atmosphere. And so any heat engine, however complex, uh, will work more efficiently when there's a larger temperature difference. In summer, 
There's very little temperature difference in the pole and the equator, actually sensibly none, and so it's a weak effect in summer. And this oscillates backwards and forwards between the, the two hemispheres. And, and of course, if you want to know why disease patterns are markedly different in the tropics from the way they are in the temperate regions, this again tells you the reason. Uh, if, if you're going to get something in the tropics, it has to be heavy enough to avoid this circulation. It has to be a rather large bacterium or a protozoa, uh, whereas if it's a virus, if it's small, it's going to come down this way. And as you can see, it's going to be the northern latitudes that are going to get it, whereas with a protozoa, it tends to be the equatorial latitudes that get it. And uh, th this is why people up in the north have uh, respiratory trouble. Uh, th this, this is the, the clear reason for it. Uh, except for one special case, uh, uh, people that don't have to be very far up in the north, and that are the unfortunate Chinese, because the, the Himalayas uh, act as a, a tremendous disturbance going, going quite high, and, and it seems as though they, they almost puncture the region of the upper atmosphere, and bring a lot of stuff down, which the Chinese get. But generally speaking, uh, the, the, the respiratory things are up in the 50 degree kind of region. Well, th this can be proved uh, if we pass to the next slide. This is my last slide. Uh, what happened was that in, on the 11th of August, 1958, there was a nuclear bomb test, and it was one of the last ones that were done in the atmosphere. And a, tra a tracer element, a radioactive tracer, rhodium-102, was included. And the explosion was in the air, and it went to great height up to the knees, because the, the Himalayas uh, act as a, a tremendous disturbance, going, going quite high, and, and it seems as though they, they almost puncture the region of the upper atmosphere, and bring a lot of stuff down, which the Chinese get. But generally speaking, uh, the, the, the respiratory things are up in the 50 degree kind of region. Well, th this can be proved uh, if we pass to the next slide. This is my last slide. Uh, what happened was that in, on the 11th of August, 1958, there was a nuclear bomb test, and it was one of the last ones that were done in the atmosphere. And a, tra a tracer element, a radioactive tracer, rhodium-102, was included. And the explosion was in the air, and it went to great height, up to about 100 kilometers. And then what was done was to monitor how the rhodium-102 came down as a, as a function of time. This was done by means of uh, planes, high-flying planes that sampled the air. And what this shows is the effect in the winter of 1959. And you can see, for example, if you take the latitudes I've just been speaking about, the 55 to, 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 to 50, this critical region that, where you get the effect, see how the, this is a logarithmic scale of the stuff that was picked up. And you can see how it sort of starts in, uh, in, early, in November and how it goes on rising and rising until you come to the end of February. That is the effect that I've been showing you that's been deduced by the meteorologists from the general kind of considerations, but, but essentially proved by this nuclear data. Could have the lights up, Nick. That, that's the last slide. Now, I have to t admit there are some people for whom all these facts are so much water off a duck's back because they believe themselves to be in possession of a simple one-line disproof of the concept of viruses incident from space. Before I come to this supposed one-line disproof, let me say that no professional virologist has ever brought it to my notice. The thing seems to rear its head mostly at a distance in discussions off stage, as it were. Viruses are specific to the cells they attack, it's said, as if to claim that human viruses are specific to human cells. While a minority of human viruses might be said to be specific to the cells of primates, most human viruses can actually be replicated in tissue cell cultures taken from a wide spectrum of animals. For instance, it's common to repli replicate human viruses in laboratories in uh, uh, in, in eggs, ordinary hen's eggs, so uh, completely, not even a mammal. 
The proper statement is that viruses are generally specific to the cells they attack to within about 150 million years of evolutionary history, biological evolutionary history. If we acknowledge that evolution was an entirely terrestrial affair, then of course it would be hard to see how viruses from outside the Earth could interact in an intimate way with terrestrial evolved cells. But we haven't any such knowledge. And in the absence of knowledge, all one can say is that viruses and evolution must go together. Either both are internal to the Earth or both are externally driven. This raises the far-reaching problem of whether biological evolution here on the Earth has been externally driven in the sense that the basic genetic information, our genes, are of external origin? Or does the usual internal theory, the neo-Darwinian theory, explain all the facts of evolution satisfactory, satisfactorily? I had a profound shock myself when I came to look into this question in detail. For although I came to the neo-Darwinian theory prepared to be critical, I never expected the situation to be quite as flimsy as it turned out to be. The reason for the widespread belief in that theory lies not, I think, in its own merits, but in a confusion in which evidence for evolution has become misinterpreted as evidence for the Darwinian theory. One can scarcely find a paper on evolutionary biology in which this mistake isn't made. The implicit assumption is that the Darwinian theory is the only theory, a presumption which begs the, obviously begs the argument. Once it's seen that life exists outside the Earth, the situation is obviously changed, and the neo-Darwinian theory must then stand on its own merits. It can't be said to be the only, the only theory. And its merits are, I believe, deficient both in fact and in logic. The first thing that is difficult for the theory when one looks at the details is to find the significant biological associations of atoms or molecules, in particular the, the polypeptides, the chains of amino acids, to get the, the correct ones. And even if one, uh, by chance, one uh, turns out to produce an improvement, uh, there are mathematical reasons why improvements don't spread as readily through a species as people tend to suppose. For example, let me just give you one example. Suppose there were a, a mutation that led to, uh, in, in a particular person, to an improvement of a tenth of a percent in some characteristic. For example, in running. And a tenth of a percent improvement in running is, is the, all the difference. It's a big change. It's the difference between the winner and the, and, and the first person pretty well and, and the last person in, in a race uh, of experts. That's, that's a big change. Uh, what, what turns out is that uh, even if that occurs, such a change occurs, w with an advantage for survival of a tenth of a percent, uh, it's only in a very small fraction uh, of such cases that the, that the improvement ever penetrates a species. The reason is that if, if a parent has two children, there's already a chance of one in a quarter that, that, that the mutation, even if it's very favorable, doesn't reach either, either the two children. There's then a chance of about three parts in 16 that in the second generation it doesn't pass on, even if it's passed on in the first, and so on. And one has to add up all these probabilities of extinction. And what, what comes out is that in the case where you have a, a tenth of a percent improvement, the only about one case in 500 will it pass to the species. 499 cases, even if something good happens, are lost just by random effects. This situation needn't uh, occasion any surprise because it's, it's obvious that complex systems, when they're left to themselves, this is a matter of experience, they're far more likely to deteriorate than to improve. So if natural selection fails for um, to add up more than a small fraction of what is good, and as it turns out, it fails to exclude a significant fraction of the much more frequent disadvantageous changes that you get in a complex system. 
how can species ever become better adapted to their environment, you might wonder. I would answer only by receiving genetic information from outside, outside the Earth. As well as bacteria and viruses, there can also be an incidence from the external universe of genes in a form that is known to biologists in the form known as viroids. From time to time, new genes from outside can become incorporated into the chromosomes of complex creatures like ourselves. Terrestrial evolution then consists of sudden changes in which new genes of external origin are brought into operation, sudden switches which paleontologists refer to nowadays as punctuated equilibria. So I would say that terrestrial evolution doesn't consist in building new genes from tiny steps. The genes are derived gratis from the cosmos, a far vaster and more varied environment than the Earth. Which brings me to the next topic of my talk. The outstanding problem of life is to understand its astonishing information content. There's nothing particular about the atoms of which living matter is composed. An atom of carbon in our bodies is no different from an atom of carbon in a lump of coal. And atoms of oxygen and nitrogen are the same in our bodies as they are in the air. And atoms of hydrogen, the same as in water. What matters for life is the arrangements of the atoms. First, you might say, into amino acids, sugars, DNA, and that kind of thing. Yet even with amino acids, sugars, and DNA, there's still a vast number of useless arrangements, useless linking of amino acids into polypeptides that couldn't catalyze chemical reactions in the manner of the enzymes, for instance. One way to represent the information content of life is by the ratio of the number of nonsense arrangements to the number of possible living arrangements. If we take this ratio for a single enzyme, taking it very conservatively to be 10 to the 20, one followed by 10, 20 zeros, the combined ratio for the whole class of some 2,000 enzymes is a number with 40,000 digits, one followed by 40,000 zeros, a number that would occupy 10 to 20 pages of print with its enormous sequence of zeros. The implications of this simple result seem to me so enormous and so unwelcome to traditional biology that every conceivable idea for avoiding it has nat somewhat naturally been sought. Some have argued that the first enzymes could have been very primitive, but this, this won't work because it's already been allowed for. The ratio 10 to the 20 for a single enzyme, one followed by 20 zeros for a single enzyme, is much less than one could reasonably take for enzymes as they exist presently. Furthermore, no suggestion for initially simple enzymes could reduce the ratio of nonsense arrangements to viable arrangements be be below 10 to the 10, that's for single enzyme, and, and one then simply has a number for the whole class of enzymes with 20,000 digits instead of 40,000 digits, and this is still a vast number. It's an obvious deception to argue, for instance, that the first living systems operated on fewer than 2,000 enzymes, and the majority of the enzymes have been found by subsequent evolution. So long as the enzymes are independent of each other, the ratio of nonsense arrangements to viable arrangements is unaffected by whether they were found piecemeal or together as a set. Only if it can be argued that most of the 2,000 enzymes were derived from a much smaller subset of primitive basic structures could the situation be changed. And this will be equivalent to arguing that many enzymes are really the same enzyme, a supposition that is surely untrue. Perhaps one could reduce the total of 2,000 somewhat in this way, but not sufficiently to make any difference to the final number, which is so vast that uh, only something enormous in principle can, can work. Next, one can seek to claim that when amino acids polymerize into chains, their orderings aren't random. 
Whilst this may be true in a moderate degree, any self-instruction there may be in the orderings of polypeptides is irrelevant to the chance of finding a viable living system of, environment, of enzymes unless it's also claimed that the self-instruction in, in, happens by a sort of divine providence, a deus ex machina, to be just such as yields the enzymes, in which case the structures of the enzymes will be predetermined in the properties of matter. The circumstance that one finds this point of view advocated in the literature sometimes is an indication of how hard-pressed one becomes if one tries to follow the conventional ideas. Fortunately, the matter can be put to an explicit test. If there were some deep principle of nature which drove organic systems toward living systems, the existence of the principle should easily be detectable in the laboratory. The ratio of the volume of the whole ocean to a chemist's test tube is a number with only some 22 zeros. So that using a test tube of organic soup instead of the whole ocean of organic soup postulated in, in the usual view of biology should merely lock 22 digits of 40,000, leaving 39,978 digits, essentially the same number as before. Nor does the length of time of the experiment matter significantly, even if the process of the origin of life were very strongly accelerating. And how, what is a strong acceleration, say, like uh, the hundredth power of the time, time raised to the hundredth in the index. Thus the reduction in the information accumulated in an hour instead of a thousand million years would then be a number with 1,300 digits, which would merely reduce the original 40,000 to 38,700, an information content that should be overwhelmingly detectable. So an experiment done in half a morning, starting from simple organic ingredients, should generate most, if not all, of the explicit structures of the enzymes. And needless to say, no, no such experiment is being performed, showing, in my view, that the enzymes did not arise by self-instruction, if indeed a disproof of this idea were needed. Of all the facts available to us, whether in biology, chemistry, physics, or astronomy, it seems to me the huge information content of living systems must surely be the most important, just because its numerical representation is so much larger than any other quantity with which we're familiar. A count of all the atoms in all the galaxies visible in the largest telescopes only yields a number with some 80 digits, which is less than the number of wrong ways of making even a quite short chain polypeptide such as histone 4. Thus, if one were allowed a random trial of amino acid arrangements for every atom in the universe, one would still be most unlikely to discover histone 4, an actually crucial substance when cells divide in the process of cell division. Perhaps other polypeptides might have served the function of histone 4 equally well, one might try to argue, but if that's so, mutations have never found them, because histone 4 is essentially unique in its amino acid chain across the whole face of biology. Ingrained in everyone, there's an instinctive feeling of a connection between ourselves and some major aspect of the universe. Early man gave expression to this feeling by inventing gods of the sea, of the air, of the woods and fields. Gods you might come on at any moment. All such materialistic representations were wrong, of course, for the reason that they were set too close to hand. It was a big step when Neolithic man, Stone Age man, invented the sun god, a step outside the earth into the cosmos, a step, I would say, surely along the correct lines. From the philosophy of Western, the, the theologies of Western uh, civilization, largely based on the Judeo-Christian view of things, aimed in a clever way to have it uh, have it both ways, by having a God that was so distant that you could never find him, and yet with explicit 
local representations, whether as Christ or as a voice from out of the burning bush. Modern science, realizing that all these material representations were wrong, dealt with the problem in a sly way. It returned to the extreme localism of primitive man. Everything concerned with ourselves was once again confined to the earth, and it dealt with the problem of the gods by semantic trickery. The word evolution, for instance, became a god. You've only to say nowadays that X evolves in the, into Y, and everybody believes you, no matter how silly or outrageous the proposition might be. But the ultimate god of modern science is chance, flukes, like finding uh, the structure of his stone form. The dilemma of man's connection with the universe is evidently to find some correct, correct, explicitly defined representation of the correction of the connection. Past attempts being wrong, I, as I believe, one either gives up the problem as too difficult, as many scientists do, or one tries in a new direction. The enormous information content of life gives, it seems to me, a clue to the di direction we might take. If life on the Earth is an outcome of genetic information received from outside the Earth as a consequence of a very long continuing development in the universe at large, many attributes of terrestrial life are likely to have the appearance of being prearranged, pre-programmed, as one might say nowadays. It's interesting that quite a number of biologists, including the great Alfred Russell Wallace, have arrived at an affirmative opinion on this question. Let me quote from a distinguished uh, modern Japanese biologist. I quote now, did the cells of our cave-dwelling predecessors already contain a set of genes which enable modern man to compose music of great complexity and write books with profound meaning. One is compelled to give an affirmative answer. It looks as though early man was already provided with an intellectual potential that was in great excess of what was needed to cope with the environment of his time. Whether from the point of view of this quotation with its music of vast complexity and literature of profound meaning, or from the point of view of the structures of biochemical substances present in the most humble microorganisms, life appears to be too overwhelmingly intricate to have been discoverable by chance processes here on the Earth. We evidently have to consider the expression on the Earth of a cosmically driven process. Let me end by illustrating this statement with an explicit example, one actually taken from the world of music. An example that, which it seems to me involves achievements too great and too long sustained to be attributable to accident. Before the late works of Beethoven became a fashion, they were thought difficult. A friend who's a composer himself explained to me one of the difficulties namely that Beethoven in his later years was apt to combine two works into one, two sonatas in one, two symphonies in one. There's no difficulty in understanding the famous Ninth Symphony on a bar-by-bar -bar basis. The difficulty lies in the overall structure. While Beethoven admirers will permit no word being said against the Ninth, critics have described its fourth movement as a failure. After my friend's remark, I came to see where the problem lies. The point is that the first and third movements together form a symphony of cosmic proportions and grandeur, closely similar, incidentally, in its structure to the Beethoven's own final piano sonata. Well, in the second and fourth movements of the ninth, Beethoven is locally down to earth, addressing you and me, more or less, on our own terms. So one should think, perhaps, of two symphonies interlaced with each other. And for my example, I want those first and third movements taken as a unity. I also want the best possible performance. But since this is to be a personal matter, a large audience being unhelpful, 
Let's think in terms of the best possible stereo reproduction with the volume set so that the long sustained drum roll in the middle of the first movement sounds as if Homer himself had caught the thunder of Zeus on Mount Olympus. But before we listen, let's inquire into the history of the composer. A poor boy, tough, hard-working, determined to force himself to the top. Had great ability to determination and no modern educational theories to prevent him from specializing. With these formidable advantages, we find Beethoven in his early 30s as the most powerful keyboard artist yet known. And we find him gradually, only gradually, establishing a name as a composer. Now, seemingly total disaster strikes. Although still a comparatively young man, Beethoven begins to go deaf. His deafness is a long drawn out affair with loud hissings in the ears, which must have introduced distortions in the oral memories of, the, of his early years. Long before the Ninth Symphony was written, Beethoven's hearing had become negligible, so that at its first performance, he could hear neither the orchestra nor the applause of the audience. Now listen and ponder how those sounds were conceived. Did Beethoven simply permute and combine memories for sound he'd acquired in his youth? At best, not reckoning any distortion due to the deafness, those memories represented a stage of development illustrated by the first and second symphonies, a universe apart from the ninth. Remember too, that it's hard to find anything in the past evolution of our species where the ability of a deaf man well beyond the prime of life to rearrange patterns of sound from far distant memories would have conferred a significant selective advantage. The alternate view is that the deaf Beethoven decisively cut off from the distractions of the world of men was able to perceive in musical form an essential component of the cosmic situation, that he was able to perceive the true cosmic origin of man. This view would be my own choice, but each of us must listen and decide. And perhaps the de decision turns on whether we ourselves hear the thunder of Zeus on Mount Olympus. Thank you. <laughs> 